faced with certain defeat, most people would understandably rather negotiate, surrender or retreat, than stand and fight to the death. The inbuilt human desire for self-preservation, causing them to desperately seek out any avenue that would enable them to retain their lives. Yet during the climax of the Battle of Siga Hill in 1809, a handful of Serbian revolutionaries decided that they would take the attacking Ottomans with them to the afterlife, in a firestorm of death and destruction, rather than surrender and place their lives and honour in the hands of a notoriously cruel and unforgiving enemy, concluding that if the day was lost and death was upon them, they would at least ensure that their foes didn't live to see it, forever tainting their victory with the steep price paid in blood. With enemy troops pouring in from all sides, Commander Stevan Sindelic detonated a nearby gunpowder magazine, the resulting explosion engulfing friend and foe, the single bullet he fired instantaneously ending the lives of thousands, and forever enshrining Sindelic's name in history. This handful of Serbian freedom fighters, demonstrating that for a select few, freedom truly is priceless. At its height, the Ottoman Empire was the preeminent superpower in the world, its borders encompassing vast tracts of land, its sultans ruling over millions of souls, and its fearsome armies time and time again, sweeping aside nations from Africa to the Middle East and Europe, its banners even carried to the gates of Vienna itself, as for a time it seemed as if the entire world might be swallowed up in the empire's insatiable jaws. Yet an inescapable rule of history seems to be that all empires, no matter how mighty they might seem, are ultimately doomed to fall into decline and eventual destruction, and by the early 19th century, the Ottoman Empire was already buckling under its own weight. The years when Ottoman sultans held almost godlike power, now merely a faint memory. Dozens of conquered and suppressed nations yearned for freedom and independence, just waiting for the right moment to throw off the shackles of Ottoman domination that they had suffered for centuries. Sensing that the empire had grown weak, patriotic revolutionaries sprung up in all corners of the empire, as the subjugated and resentful populations of once proud and independent nations began openly challenging the sultan's power, realising that the chance to free themselves from their hated overlords, once and for all, had finally arrived. The Balkans was one part of the empire that was especially resentful of Ottoman rule, an area of Europe home to the Serbs, a people who had for 400 years suffered under the yoke of a regime that could be unimaginably tyrannical and cruel to those who refused to toe the line. For centuries, the very idea of such a small nation ever defeating the mighty Ottomans in battle and winning independence was little more than a fantasy, however times were changing. The Ottoman administration had become excessively corrupt and highly inefficient, the governing elites now so detached from reality that they failed to embrace the rapid technological, economic and social changes taking place in the rest of Europe, as new empires rose in the west while the stagnant east fell into terminal decline. In much of the empire's peripheral territories, including the Balkans, the Sultan's authority now existed on paper only, his control weakened to such an extent that local governors acted as the real power in their respective provinces, merely paying lip service to the authority of the Sultan in Constantinople, while the Janissaries, a body of men considered to be the elite of the Ottoman army, now ran rampant through territory they were once charged with defending effectively doing as they pleased and acting as petty warlords and bandits. The Janissaries were once the elite of the Ottoman war machine, young Christian boys torn away from their families in conquered European territories and indoctrinated into a warrior culture that produced some of the most fearsome soldiers on the planet. However, this invaluable fist of the Ottoman Sultan had begun to become more trouble than it was worth. Acting in defiance of the Sultan's commands, many of these upstart Janissaries began to develop ideas far above their station, fancying themselves as fully independent warlords, reigning supreme over their own personal fiefdoms. It was clear that sooner or later, these troublesome Janissaries would have to be reined in, even if it meant allying with a group of dangerous bandits and revolutionaries against a common enemy. 
This dangerous tension between the Ottoman Janissaries and the Ottoman Sultan was especially heated in Serbia, where soldiers, regional governors, and aristocratic landowners found themselves engaged in a desperate scramble to fill the power vacuum created by the Sultan's increasingly ineffective leadership. Now believing themselves to be beyond the control of the Sultan and his centralized government, Janissaries across Serbia began collecting taxes to fill their own personal coffers, engaging in what was essentially unauthorized plunder and theft against the Serbian people. In 1791, the Sultan attempted to bring the escalating situation back under his control, ordering the Janissaries to seize their illegal activities and leave Belgrade, and when they refused to comply, he called on the Serbian nobility for military support. However, this new alliance failed, and merely served to foster the growth of paranoia in the minds of the breakaway Janissaries, who were now convinced that the Serbs were working with the Sultan to unseat them from power and claw back their privileges. In 1801, the out-of-control Janissaries murdered the Ottoman governor of the Belgrade province, a popular man who had been known as Mother of the Serbs due to his light-handed and fair treatment of Serbians under his rule. Taxes were raised, forced labour was imposed, and the Serbs suffered as the tyranny of the Janissaries went unchecked. Yet the Serbian breaking point would be reached three years later, during an event known as the Slaughter of the Dukes, several days of violence that resulted in the assassination of dozens of high-ranking Serbian nobles, a move which backfired with spectacular results. The Janissaries believed that murdering the leadership of any potential Serbian rebellion would deprive the Sultan of a powerful tool to use against them and squash any remaining resistance amongst the Serbs. However, the brutal beheading of these popular and important men merely served to enrage the Serbian population under their control. This slaughter unleashed the first Serbian uprising, as in response to this shocking violence, Serbian militias began openly attacking the Janissaries, winning several surprising victories that exposed just how weak, ill-equipped, and outnumbered the Janissary overlords were. Shocked by the wave of unrest crashing against them, the Janissaries appealed for help from the very man they had earlier sought to break away from, the Sultan in Constantinople. Declaring the Serbs to be in full revolt, they demanded assistance from the Ottoman government, however the Sultan refused, seemingly content to let both sides fight it out. Believing that the Serbian nationalists could be controlled and harnessed for his own ends, the Sultan allowed them to wage war upon the rebellious Janissaries across Serbia, no doubt hoping that the rebels could finally destroy the men who had been causing him so much trouble. However, it soon became clear that many of these now battle-hardened Serbian revolutionaries held no desire to return to the old status quo as powerless subjects of the Sultan, with some now loudly expressing their wish to throw off the shackles of Ottoman domination once and for all. Although the Serbs had technically been fighting on the same side as the Sultan against the renegade Janissaries, the Sultan feared the Serb army's growing power, realizing that once the Janissary leaders had been defeated, the Serbs would turn on him and demand independence. Faced with a conflict that was spiraling out of control, Sultan Selim could no longer idly sit by. He officially declared the Serbs to be rebels and traitors, promptly dispatching an army to crush their uprising and restore order to the strife-ridden province. Yet the Serbs were no longer a simple ragtag band of idealists and freedom fighters, and had emerged from the conflict with the Janissaries stronger than ever, their force now moulded into a large and effective army led by highly competent commanders. The shocked Ottomans suffered a string of convincing defeats at the hands of the Serbs, who now formed their own government and set to work returning land to the people, reducing taxes, and abolishing forced labour. Serbian leaders made desperate attempts to obtain backing from other major powers, however at the time Europe was embroiled in the Napoleonic Wars, with no nation willing to risk making an enemy of the Ottomans, while Napoleon's armies were sweeping across the continent. The Serbs were on their own against the full might of the Ottoman Empire, a force that was unwilling to back down, no matter how many defeats they suffered. 
presented with a real chance at winning back their freedom after 400 years of subjugation. Thousands of idealistic patriots swelled the ranks of this new Serbian army, as what was initially a minor regional dispute escalated into a full-scale war of independence. One of these fervently patriotic revolutionaries was Stevan Sindelic, a man who had been fighting the Ottomans since the uprising began. Sindelic proved himself to be a capable fighter and promising leader, his raw talent eagerly seized upon by the commander-in-chief of the Serbian Revolutionary Army, who appointed Sindelic as commander of his own infantry brigade. Yet despite partaking in several major victories against the Ottomans, it would be at the Battle of Segar Hill in 1809 that Sindelic would forever secure his place in the history books. 10,000 Serbian rebels took up defensive positions in the villages surrounding the Ottoman-controlled fortress of Niš, digging six heavily fortified trenches so that the fortress was now completely surrounded. The biggest of these trenches was dug into Segar Hill and defended by the brigade of Stefan Sindelic. The Niš fortress was of great strategic importance and controlling it would block Ottoman entry into the rest of Serbia creating a choke point that might improve the war's balance of power which was so heavily tipped against the Serbs. The Serbian plan was to lay siege to the fortress, cut it off from outside supplies, and force the occupants to surrender before any Ottoman reinforcement armies could arrive. However, as the weeks dragged on, several Serbian attacks against the fortress's thick walls were repulsed with heavy losses, the Serbs lacking the heavy artillery required to create a breach in its mighty defences. Some two months after the siege began, disaster struck when an Ottoman army of 20,000 reinforcements loomed on the horizon, ready to break the rebel siege and slaughter all those who had dared to stand against the Sultan. The Ottomans quickly began assaulting the Serbian-held trenches, and despite facing stubborn resistance from the rebels, the trenches began to fall one by one. The Ottoman hammer then fell on the trench occupied by Stevan Sindelic and his men. Thousands of Ottoman troops charged forward, hundreds falling in volleys of dense gunfire as thick smoke filled the air, choking and blinding the men on the ground as they desperately fought for their lives. Wave after wave of Ottoman troops were cut down by the Serbs as the day of bloody fighting dragged on. However, despite resisting with intense ferocity, the Ottomans eventually broke through, pouring into the trenches and surrounding Sindelic and his men, who were now engaged in vicious hand-to-hand -hand combat as they fought for each second of life. Serbian numbers were slowly being whittled away as bayonets, knives, and even bare hands became the weapons of choice. Trapped in a trench which was now swarming with Ottoman troops, and with just a fraction of his men still alive, Sindelic knew that his position was now hopeless. Yet rather than surrendering to despair, the defiant Serbian commander resolved to go down fighting while taking as many of the enemy with him as he could. As the Ottomans closed in around him, baying for his blood, Sindelic pulled out his pistol and pointed it at his brigade's substantial stores of gunpowder. His last words to his men warned them of the fate that awaited any who refused to flee. Save yourself, brothers, who wants and who can, those who stay will die. Waiting until the last possible moment before an Ottoman bayonet or bullet could rob him of life, Sindelic squeezed the trigger of his pistol, the single bullet fired, detonating the entire gunpowder magazine. The resulting explosion tore through the trench and surrounding hill, engulfing Serb and Ottoman alike, as all those caught in its fiery embrace had their lives promptly snuffed out. On the cusp of victory, the watching Ottoman commander Hershid Pasha witnessed what should have been a glorious end to the hard-fought battle, transformed into a stark display of Serbian bravery, defiance, and commitment to their cause, as hundreds of his best men were torn to pieces in an apocalyptic-like scene of fire and smoke. The Ottomans had won the day, but the joy of victory had been taken from them, with 3,000 Serbs and 6,000 Ottomans laying dead on the field. 
Furious by the almost insane act of self-sacrifice and defiance carried out by Sindlich and his men, Hershid Pasha ordered his remaining men to scowl the battlefield in search of the remains of the martyred Serbs who had caused so much carnage. The heads of some 952 Serbian revolutionaries were removed from the lifeless corpses, skinned and then used as the building blocks for a gruesome skull tower constructed on the road to Constantinople, as a warning to locals of the fate that would await any and all enemies of the mighty Ottoman Empire. However, despite intending to intimidate and demoralize the Serbs, the giant skull tower actually had the opposite effect, causing immense resentment and serving as a highly visible reminder of the Empire's potential for cruelty, while at the same time forever keeping alive the memory of Sindelic and his men, memorializing the valiant act of sacrifice and inspiring thousands of others to continue resisting no matter the cost motivating the Serbs to continue their struggle until independence was eventually won in 1878. In fact, the presence of the Skull Tower was so counterproductive that it was eventually removed by the Ottomans themselves, with many of the skulls retrieved by relatives and given a proper burial. However, today, 57 skulls still remain embedded within the tower, which is now housed inside a chapel, the site serving as a permanent national memorial to Sindelic and the fallen Serbs who made the last stand on the hill that day. I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and I'll see you again soon.